So, yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi, John. Um, and all you viewers out there, uh, my name is Michael Pilarski. I'm with the Global Earth Repair Foundation. And today I'm getting to interview John D. Liu, the founder of the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Movement. And so I'm uh, excited to be here today with John. Now, John, you were a keynote speaker at our Global Earth Repair Conference in May 2019 and I was organizing the conference and we had hardly any time to actually chat. So I'm thrilled that we have had two days together to really, you know, sync uh, to, to talk much more about the ecosystem restoration camps movement and ecosystem repair. So uh, I learned a few things from you here and I'm going to have you uh, say some things uh, to our audience here. So the, the ecosystem restoration camps, let's just do a little history. And I believe it was like 2016 when you first, you know, broached the idea. Or it, what was yeah, the history well, there? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, you have to go back about three decades, really, to understand this. So I started to, I was asked by the World Bank to film a baseline study of the rehabilitation of China's Lus Plateau, which is in the upper and middle reaches of the Yellow River. And it's the cradle of Chinese civilizations. And when I... When I did this, I compared that to the geopolitical events I'd been covering as a, as a producer and cameraman for CBS News and then Radio Televisione Italiana and Zweite Deutsches Fernsehen. So I did that for 15 years and I was in the middle of these big geopolitical changes that were taking place in the latter part of the 20th century. And then I saw the ecological destruction and the potential of restoration. And I thought, well, that's way more important than actually any of the other stories that I'd been covering. And they were huge stories, like the rise of China from poverty and isolation and the collapse of the Soviet Union, that level. And um, when, I, when I thought about the importance that I was seeing, I realized, well, actually, hundreds of generations of human beings have failed to understand this. And that's why we're degrading the landscape, that the landscape is not valued. So, by, but by 2016, I had been having these, I had been working for a long time in this area, so 20 some years. And then I realized that we were gonna fail. <laughs> to restore the earth. So it didn't matter if I learned this or understood this, because the institutional development is basically there to maintain the status quo. It's not there to transform human civilization. And so I started having these weird dreams that people were gonna go camping <laughs> and restore the earth. And I'd wake up in the morning and I'd, ha I'd, I'd, I'd be on some mountainside and there'd be tents and people are getting up and going to have breakfast and then they'd work a few hours and and do restoration and everybody was happy and it was it was a very satisfying fulfilling thing but i also when i woke up i went you know what what, what you, that's impossible you know nobody's going to go camping and fix the earth but i kept having the dreams so after i after these dreams were repeated again and again i thought well I better write something about this because I'm, you know, I'm obviously processing this in the middle of the night subconsciously, but, or while I'm asleep somehow. And, um, you know, I better, I better write about it. When I wrote about it on the internet, a lot of people wrote back, like, I'm having the same dream. So all these people started saying, we're having the same dream. And I thought, okay, <laughs> that's different. You know, so maybe there's something to this. And then we started to talk about, well, how could we do this? And that ended up creating a foundation. When a thousand people pledged to give 10 euros per month to make this a reality, then we had to create a foundation. And then when we created the foundation, we started the first camp in Spain and then the next year, the second camp in Mexico. So and what, what years were that? That was 2000? 2000, 2017, we got the, 
we got the uh, the foundation going, and then we just started discussing the first camp in Spain, and then in 2018, I think the second camp in in Mexico began, and then in, in there was lots of discussion uh, last year, and then by this year there are 23 camps which are registered and there are another 33 which have applied and there are another 50 probably behind that that would like to get into the system so what we see is that there's a possibility there's unlimited amounts of degraded land around the earth and um, if we choose to restore the earth that it's a positive and it's a good thing but it's transformational because it's not in the existing economy. The existing economy says it's too expensive to restore the earth. But if you're thinking from a humane perspective, you know, it's we what else is there to yeah, do? yeah, yeah, that's the only that's the only thing that we have to do. So uh, so in at the end of 2020, there is the possibility that there let's say there's a hundred camps well uh, there'll be probably it's more like eight, 70 or 80 75 okay. well at some I like the the, the number a hundred because it's easy to do uh, multiply <laughs> yeah. so at some point here in the not too distant future we'll end up with a hundred camps and I yet when we were talking the other day John you had the this uh, idea that uh, a camp would could grow people would learn there be a camaraderie and at some point, it would, could be strong enough, and there were enough people, that it could split into two, and another camp could be formed. And so when I did the arithmetic, if you had a, and it, it, if, if a camp uh, could split every year, that it would get strong enough that it could spin off another camp. And uh, if you start with 100 camps in one year, at the end of that, you'd have 200 camps, and then they split, it'd be in 400 camps. And so at the end of the fourth year, you could have 1,600 camps around the world and that's you know that's kind of ex exponential growth but that's like we need at least i mean we need millions thousands, thousands million, millions. You know, everywhere needs a if everywhere in the world almost needs a restoration camp yeah and so anyway i just like this idea folks that there is a need for a lot of restoration camps and john is on the way to you know sort of getting it the ball started and then it can snowball down and this needs exponential growth to really pull pull things together yeah um, well I would say you know there's some there's some things that we we see now we see quite a lot of people who understand that there's degradation and they would really like to do something but they don't know exactly what to do and then you also have a professional class so you have all these people who say well I'm a professional restorationist or I'm a professional whatever and you know that that's that sort of separates the people who don't have those credentials and they say well you're you're you can't participate <laughs> you have nothing to do you know and then they're consumers and so they're not involved in in this well they all have a role to play the people who are growing a compost pile in their yard in in who who are who are growing plants and you know they're doing more to mitigate and adapt to climate changes than anybody who's writing pieces of paper and going to meetings all over the world to talk about it because that's nothing that's a theoretical thing we don't have a theoretical problem we have physical problems so if you're increasing biodiversity increasing biomass and increasing organic material you are naturally re-regulating the climate you are protecting and encouraging the return of biodiversity you are ensuring a sustainable future for your children and future generations so so john when we talked the other day um and i was hypothesizing how many people would we need to help fix the world and how many how many camps etc and and uh, you said well everybody should be involved and i love that answer folks is that Everybody can have a role to play, and so one of the you know in the not, in the not too distant future, I'm going to make a little video on how to you can contribute to the global ecosystem restoration in your own yard, you know ecosystem restoration at the yard scale, and so what we want to have uh, all those all scales and as many people involved as possible. 
Yeah. Um, well, you know, the thing that's come to me, I, I sort of realized, so as a journalist covering all those big geopolitical events, always made me confused because there was so much data and how could you really know about like the Soviet Union or the sort of, sort of the political uh, realities in China uh, or you know the geopolitical events between nations the the kind of foreign foreign relations stuff like uh, spheres of influence or you know all of these different concepts that really are quite old and may get in the way of actually a world movement yeah well they're in the they're but but anyway they're confusing and what i realized when i started to study ecology was it's not confusing it's not my opinion that the accumulation of organic matter changes the surface temperatures or increases soil moisture it's just not my opinion and this is very satisfying to learn something like, well, that's a truth. That's a fundamental truth. And that's not only a fundamental truth, but it comes from evolutionary succession. And so when you really understand it, you're, you're aligned with how the earth is, it, it functions. And you know how the atmosphere was created, constantly filtered and continuously renewed. And that's also true of the fresh water system and the soil fertility. And, and the ozone layer. And all of the, well, all the complexity, all of the symbiotic relationships between living things. So it's not, it's not, I mean, there, you can easily get to the edge of mystery. So there is mystery, yeah, I mean, the cosmos, I mean, really, I mean, <laughs> we don't understand everything, but we know enough to know that biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter are the, the indicators and the determinants of of fully functional ecosystems. So if we know that collectively as a society, then it, it puts in perspective materialism or power politics or racism or discrimination or, or these other <coughs> things. So um, one of the things we talked about is uh, I was looking at the example of Ethiopia has done a lot in the last decade or you know, 15 years or so. They've had a nationwide regreening and ecosystem restoration, uh, you might say, uh, campaign, and it's sort of led by the government. They they pay people in various ways to to do it. A lot of people are involved, and 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 you can see Ethiopia greening up from the satellite. So they're really doing a a, you know, a lot of good work, and. Uh, and you mentioned that you're very familiar with that work. That uh, you know, governments running the the restoration movement, as it were, that there's downsides to that, and and that private, you know, like a, a, a more of a, of the um, you might say the private sector or the or the, a communal movements or that people doing it um, out of their own hearts rather than than governments paying them is is maybe preferable or, you know, what, well, where, where, where? I, I'm not sure if I would come down, you know, I would, I would definitely say if a government or the, you know, governments understand the role of restoration, then they're obligated to, to value it and to support the people who do it. Mm -hmm. But my conclusion when I, started dreaming into the creation of the ecosystem restoration camps movement was that well i know the timelines for these giant governmental projects the costs the overheads the 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 complexity or it, it's it, it's it's not the complexity it's the complicatedness of these of these projects and they take too long and they're also at the whim of the whoever's the, in government and they're expensive time. they take too long and so they're the most expensive and the least effective so what we're <laughs> so what we're saying or what, what I hear you saying John is that we don't want to leave this up the world restoration you know the world restoration up to the governments 
it's like we the people have to sort of like rise up to the challenge yes. and, and and maybe hold their feet to the fire so that they actually contribute more but that we don't want to just leave it up to them well the i think what we're saying is that we need to empower everyone to be able to participate and we haven't done that and so the question is do we need permission <laughs> or can we just decide we have to restore the earth? I mean, we have a duty to our children, to future generations of humanity and other species to, to actually act. So it isn't really like we need to ask permission, we need to act. So how do we act? How do we act and have the way forward be the least expensive and the most effective instead of the most expensive and the least effective. So that's when camping emerged is like, well, what do we like to do? Well, we like to go camping. We like to garden. So if we go camping and we garden carefully, we study, we listen to the land, we listen to the indigenous people. This, this place we are here now, this was a huge, massive forest before. So that had reached a kind of uh, ecological climax. It's not static, it's a, it's a dynamic equilibrium, but it had reached this in, in amazing state where it was fully functional, as functional as possible. Of course, you know, if an asteroid hit or a volcano went off or there was something, it would, it would have to react to that. But now, this biome is perhaps three to five percent of what it was at its evolutionary climax. Well, that means huge amounts of water are not being absorbed. It's being, it's being evaporated off the Pacific Ocean. It's coming inland, but the, the mechanism for absorbing all that water into the soil and into the biomass and having it respirate is gone. Or Greatly reduced. Greatly reduced. So, yeah, this is not the worst. I mean, if you go to the Middle East, whoa, you know, just bare sand and nothing. And, you know, the heat hits you like a brick and, you know, you just, whoa. But when you understand that through the pollen records, through all sorts of other records, we know exactly what was there. It was a garden. It was too. beautiful. The land of milk and honey. So is that an impossibility now? How, how, we have to say, oh, well, historically that was destroyed. There's nothing we can do. Well, no, that's not true. We're following the people who destroyed these systems and saying, oh, we believe in materialism. Well, the materialism ends up on the junk pile. It's trash. The natural systems continuously filter, you know, constantly filter, continuously renew the natural systems we depend on for life. What is more valuable, junk or the systems that create the atmosphere, the hydrological cycle and the soil fertility? It's ludicrous. You know, we have to understand this. We're forced to understand this. And I used to want to grab people by the shirt, you know, and say, hey, you have to listen to me, you know, and then like, get off me. Nobody wants to hear, hear me. So then I realized, okay, that is not a strategy. That doesn't work. So what, what is it that I have agency over? What can I do? And I found, well, the only thing I can do is decide what I do. So then I said, well, I'm just gonna do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna imagine it's possible to restore all degraded lands on the earth and I'm gonna <laughs> live my life, the rest of my life, however long I've got, is gonna be dedicated to that. And in the doing, I was empowered. And when I, when I realized was, all these people are going, well, John, John, you're doing this. You're, wow, that's wonderful, that's great. Instead of my telling them they have to do it, I just had to do it. And then when, when they understand this, then they have they have the power to they are empowered to do it as well we need so many more people a lot of you listeners out there 
there are so many people that don't have a purpose in life. They don't have a mission. They're just, you know, they may make a living. They may be falling through the cracks. But, uh, you know, the Earth Restoration Movement is, is, uh, has room for everybody that wants to join in. And it's a great thing to devote your life to. We need people, we need a lot of people, millions of people to say, I am going to devote, devote my life to this, or at least a big chunk of their life. You can't do it every day in and day out, but uh, yes. And so I've been, like you, John, been on this uh, devoted for, for many decades now. And, and we, you know, there's, a, we, there's room for everybody to come on board and uh, you can start doing it at a local level. You don't need permission. You don't need, you know, any rate, there's a lot to talk about, <laughs> but, um, that's for sure. Um, so John, the, the other day we had a little discussion about refugee camps and how ecosystem camps could put, interface with the, the world has way too many refugee camps and they're pretty grim places. And how can ecosystem restoration camps, uh, interface with, or, work with refugee camps and maybe a few words about that well yeah i think that's the potential but i think we have to prove that ecosystem restoration camps can be efficient and effective you can't you can't go to these disaster areas and you become like a another dependent who's needing help you know you mm -hmm. if you go if we go there as ecosystem restoration camps, we better know exactly what we're doing. We better have the infrastructure we need to train, to live comfortably, because you, you also don't want to send people into harm's way. So you want to create a very safe situation. So you have to be able to handle the freshwater systems. So you have got to figure out where's the water coming from? How do we make sure it's absolutely safe, it's not polluted, we're not going to get, get people sick? And then you need to deal with the food. So you need to feed everybody. So you need to be careful with this. We, we have a lot of food waste in the world today, even like here, because we, 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 we haven't figured out yet everything, how to do this. We need to have a system where you have people in charge of the food and everybody's fed and nobody's hungry. There is no hunger in, in our communities. Everyone is fed and everyone has a place to stay and everybody has work to do. And then the question is like, if we can do that, if we can learn to build the infrastructure, we can learn to live harmoniously together in these camps, and we can train everybody in restoration techniques. So how to infiltrate and retain moisture, how to grow organic soils, how to grow vegetation from many different levels as you very well know. Um, from grasses to forbs <laughs> to, to uh, trees. And it's every, every level, multi-dimensional, multi-level uh, systems. And train people how to do that. If we're able to do that and deliver, for instance, in containers, the camp infrastructure, and like it, two days a week it's up and the fully functional camp is there. It's got raised bed agriculture to feed people immediately, plant things for greens, I mean, carry in seedlings and plant them out and immediately you, you're going to get food. Rapidly you're going to get food. And then, then training. So you have a core group of people who are the trainers and then you have, I would say, the, the ideal for refugee camps would be to ring the giant refugee camps. I mean, there are refugee camps with half a million people in them. You know, I don't think we can go, go inside of those camps and take care of the situation. We have to like ring them with ecosystem restoration camps and then take 10 or 15 people to, to each one of the camps and start training them. How long is that training? Weeks or something? And then when they know what they're doing, they leave and some more people come. And so they're implementing this throughout the camp, everywhere, through the refugee camps. And when we do that, first of all, it takes all these people who are now like confused and like, what, I can't be at home. And it gives them a purpose so they can help themselves. They can feed themselves. They can make the camp better. They can make the sanitation better. They can make the vegetation better. When they leave, 
the place, it can be better than when they, they went into this camp rather than be this scorched earth place that, that, that they've, that's been destroyed by having half a million people live there. And um, so not only that, but let's hope that the whatever wars or catastrophes that have forced them to leave their homes are, are over and they can go home. And when they go home, they take the skills necessary to restore their, their homes. So this is a, not just a short-term band-aid fix. This is like, let's fix the situation. Let's give them a chance. And, and many of these people have lost their human rights. Mm -hmm. So how can they get their human rights back? Well, this is also how they get there. This is how they stand up and get their human rights back. We and the rest of the people on the whole earth, we have to have to say, you have equal rights. We can't say oh, it's okay for you to live in a refugee camp and you know be miserable. Right for the rest, you know, for yeah. generations or anything. It's no, horrible. You gotta no. you know go back. Yeah. So or at least to a new yeah. Or at any rate. So they so on the one hand, of, they become part of the restoration movement in a way. We yes. there, it's a big training camp. Yes, but I have to tell you we have to be good in order to do that. So some people hear about ecosystem restoration and go, oh, it's easy to do restoration. No, it's not. It's not easy. It's difficult. Hundreds of generations of human beings would not have failed to understand this if it were easy. It's difficult. But because it's difficult, it's kind of worth doing. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's like a worthy task. You know, if you if it's too easy, you know, oh, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And I think you can spend your whole life every day doing this, but you have to get into a different perspective. And when you do, you realize this is life, and this is a better way of life than entertaining ourselves or 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 consuming things or doing what is expected of us from some sort of giant corrupt machine that that really prefers to control us and we're not free so i think let's be free let's restore the earth that's what we need to do and the more people who do that the better the earth's going to be the better their individual lives are going to be and the more fun we're going to have as a community festivals and singing and you know, just being able to sit at the campfire with, with all of you guys is, is pretty good. You know, so. Yeah, life is, uh, so just to tell people where we're at here, we're at uh, one of the ecosystem restoration camps at the very beginning uh, of Camp Hotlam in on the slopes of Mount Shasta in Northern California. Uh, the, a lot of the ecosystem has been degraded by over over logging, you know, or you know, clear-cut logging, and and they change the nature of the place. And so, this camp is just one, you know, is one of the forerunners, so that we can, you know, we to get good, we're going to have to practice. We're yeah. going to take it's going to take some time, but we're uh, we're on we're on the move. And so, John, that's great that you are opening up this opportunity to, to for people. So, if people out there are interested in you know volunteering at a restoration camp for whatever length of time or really joining the movement How, where would they start john what's their website or where would they where would they go to <laughs> well ecosystem restoration camps dot org is set up now and each of the individual camps i think there are 23 now that are registered and they if if they've gone through the whole process then they already have their own websites or their own connections pages on the the movements uh, website or connections from that to their sites and so you could go to now Guatemala or Egypt or India or west coast of the United States and I think they're working in Appalachia and uh, Mexico and South Africa and you know there, there's Kenya there are many many places around the world and then there are more that are forming so generally speaking, the local people are going to have to carry the ball. These, these, these camps are self-organizing, self-governing, and they are, they are autonomous. But they are linked together, and 
that means that all the knowledge that we can gather together can be shared with knowledge exchange, that we can have courses and training in all different biomes, tropical, alpine, grasslands, forests, agricultural, regenerative agricultural practices, permaculture. And so that's what's happening in these different places. And it is a great way to spend your time because you're busy and you're having fun and it's you, you know it's necessary and and it does this interesting thing that happened to me after I left journalism my mind went quiet it became very satisfying to realize oh there are truth there's truth it's not just relativism <laughs> that's out there there's truth the the earth spins and wobbles and circles the sun and the whole solar system moves through space and you know the the organic material as each generation of life dies and gives up its body it nurtures the next generations of life and those kinds of realizations can come to you when you are grounded and quiet and listening to the earth Mm -hmm. And, well, one of the, uh, so you mentioned some of the benefits of joining the movement, but I'd just like to point out to people that you really become part of a community. And we are community-minded social creatures. And so, um, after all this uh, big round of social isolation in the world because of COVID, it's become really even more clear to a lot of people that they need a community, uh, a place to belong people that they like being with and so this we we are this is a way to join a community with it has a real joy of life and has a real purpose in life and so i recommend that and one last thing i would point out to people is that the uh, e ecosystem restoration camps has just uh, put started putting on their first online course in restoration so it's a great prep way to sort of get yourself more educated to go to camps or start your own we you know you don't just have to go to somewhere else that's already started you can start a camp where you are um, so there's the you can find out about the course um, at their website and the, that's fall this current one their first one and the next one will start in january 2021 so um, well maybe it can be great. bigger let's well they'll learn a lot in this first course and maybe it can be double or triple the size or there can be multiple multiple cohorts or something like that mm -hmm. and especially if, if if a lot of the stuff is recorded then it can just run continuously and be made available all over the world so we th i think that's a right and eventually of course it will be in other languages as well as right now it's uh, starting out in english but uh you know, it's, it's a big world out there, and, and every camps will have to be different culturally and different countries. It's not they're all, you know, they're, they're not like a cookie cutter thing that's no. stamped out. They're all individual, like you say, they're autonomous. You know, and I, I would also just mention that I think that, you know, we, 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 the governments can definitely be involved. It's just that the people are making their, <laughs> their voices heard. They're deciding that you know this is this movement is about the people deciding okay we got to restore the earth there's nothing else that's more important right now and so that gives us power to decide what we do and in doing that we have to take care of everyone we have to say everyone in the camp is fed everyone is cared for everyone is equal and if we do that we're answering many of these historical problems that have been growing and getting worse and worse. And if we do that, then the next generations, they don't have to deal with those problems. They'll have new problems, but they won't have these, these, these old problems because we will have addressed them. And if we don't address them, we, we can look at the Black Lives Matter now or the indigenous people or the, the, the refugee situation around the world, all of these problems. We, we really need to deal with them. And it's not just like, how do you infiltrate water and how do you grow up the vegetation and the biodiversity that we have to deal with? We have to say, oh, in the doing of this, 
in the doing of infiltrating water and restoring the vegetation and the biodiversity and the soils and the atmosphere and the hydrological cycle and climate regulation, we also get the chance to change the way we live with one another and, and the, the changed ourselves. And part of the healing of the earth is part of healing of humanity. And when you go out there and work with the land and you're out in nature, it's much more likely that you're going to have a, a good mental equilibrium. And right now there's a lot of people that are, yeah. you know, they might say there's a lot of damaged earth, but there's a lot of damaged people out there. And, and the act of working, doing this kind of work is actually, is helping heal ourselves too. Well, there are people in the United States, for instance, who are homeless. And they're wandering around in the streets and begging for somebody to hand them a, something to eat or something. Well, they, they have equal rights. They deserve respect and to participate, but they don't maybe expect to become the CEO of a major corporation and take home hundreds of millions of dollars a year. So are we saying that, oh, they didn't make hundreds of millions of dollars. They're not as good as the CEO. We have to say, no, they're equal to anybody. They're human beings, they live on the earth. Their, their DNA is connected to all life since the beginning of time. It can't be any other way. And so if they're alive, they deserve equal rights. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all living beings are endowed with certain inalienable rights. Mm -hmm. So. This is a chance to live the change that we want to see on the earth. And what else have we got to do, really? Yeah, yeah it's fun. So thank you, John, for this interview. I hope a lot of people are going to watch this over time where I'm thrilled to, you know, our Global Earth Repair Foundation members get a chance to hear you speak in this way. And so um, there's a lot to do, folks. Uh, and. Uh, this is the wave of the future. John, thank you for helping start this movement. You know, yeah, <laughs> go for it. Let's go for it, folks. And uh, blessings to everybody. Thank you, Michael.